Thank you all for being here today. I want to uh, thank the only person who, really who has a job that, cooler than mine, and that's uh, Jeannie Garbarino for setting this all up. And, um, and, and with that, uh, who, who's ready for some science? Oh, we, can, we, can do, we can do better than that. Who's ready for science? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. All right, all right. <laughs> so. My name is Dan Garreau, and I'm here to teach you about optics, the science of light. But I wasn't always this good looking. In fact, some time ago, I had more hair than I do today, and I was not much older than you. And this is my first imaging, I made my first imaging system out of a laser and a few lenses and a, a photo detector circuit I had built. By by melting and pulling a glass pipette until it was thinner than a single human hair, we were able to make a, a cantilever that worked like a little springboard. And by attaching a, a muscle fiber to that springboard and getting it to pull, we were able to use a laser to image that springboard and measure how far it pulled. And Therefore, we were able to measure the force exerted by a single muscle fiber. And that's basic science, where you understand how basic things work. But there's another kind of science called translational science. When John D. Rockefeller bought the last remaining farm on the island of Manhattan, our island, to make the Rockefeller University, the mission was not just to do the basic science, it was primarily to use our understanding to figure out how to help people. And that's called translational science. And that's my favorite kind of science. And we're gonna do it by using light. Why light? Light is amazing because it is both really useful and really interesting. The, the biggest part of our brain, the occipital lobe, is dedicated to vision. And we use light all the time to see. But what is light? A wave or a particle? And why does it only move at the speed of light? Those are great questions. But in engineering, we can use it if we understand how it behaves. And there is a set of equations, a relatively simple set of equations, that completely characterizes the practical behavior of light. So that's, that's why I like to use light, because it is both very useful for these simple equations, and it is very interesting, because no one knows what light really is. So we use the equations of optics to make devices. And we have a lot of fun doing it, in fact. This is, this is me and a guy named David Huang measuring the cells in my tongue. Um, you, can, you can give this technology a like, or you can give it a lick. <laughs> um, with a laser imaging system he built. And apparently, they give big prizes for this sort of thing, right? David just won the Lasker Prize for this system. And if you don't know what that is, it's sort of like the MTV VMA, VMA awards for science, so that for the children can understand that. But whether it's basic science or translational science, it's all optics, the science of light. And like all sciences, it is a multi-generational enterprise that spans the ages. The whole point of science, in fact, is to build on knowledge that came before us. Well, 1670, this was the first person to use microscopy to look at biology. And then this person wasn't necessarily interested in microscopes, per se, but was the first person to sort of think about how a laser might work. And then this person took Einstein's basic science and knowledge around how a laser might work and translated it by making that basic theory real. Around the same time, this person made a 3D microscope, a confocal microscope. 
And we're getting really close now to being able to unlock great knowledge and powerful insight in biology and medicine. But it's not till later when this person figured out how to put a mirror ball, like a disco ball, inside the confocal microscope to make it scan a thousand times faster. And then I came in. <laughs> I made it even faster and much simpler, and I did it by throwing away all the expensive moving components. And I made the first solid state confocal microscope for doing pathology. We are going to scale the confocal microscope technology and bring pathology, the fundamental cornerstone of medicine, this is pathology, is how, you, how one diagnoses disease, to the world, uh, to the whole world. Um, so what you see in this video is a specimen. This is a tissue specimen that normally leads a, needs a whole lab, but our quick and easy process by staining it, you put it on the cassette, you drop the top on, it's Gets it up, squishes it up, and then it does the scanning. This does the job that the uh, entire pathology lab does. So it makes it easier, faster, and hopefully better for patients. As a disclaimer, I have a financial interest in this technology, which has not been reviewed by the FDA, has not been approved safe or effective, and may not be used to manage patient care yet. The image it produces, though, is worth a thousand words. It shows millions of cells, and these are the type of patterns that are used by conventional pathologists to diagnose cancer and save lives. But this technology is faster, less expensive, and 3D, which means the data could be much richer. It works so fast that we may be able to scan a patient's specimen and tell within minutes whether that patient is healthy or sick at the very low cost. If we can use this technology to lower the barrier to entry, to make it easier to do the life-saving diagnosis, we can help a lot of people, but more, most importantly, oh, oh, well, that's most importantly, actually. <laughs> I don't even need to say most importantly. But also, we can grow the data. So the story is that where uh, Jeff Bezos grew data about products, they, he made a, a website called Amazon. And where Mark Zuckerberg grew data that was social data, he made a website called Facebook. And we want to grow medical data to really get a hold on disease. And that's very exciting. But I also want to share with you a couple of other things we can do with this microscope that are pretty cool. This is the beating heart of an embryo that we can see in the egg with the confocal microscope. Now, the holes let a certain number of blood cells through. And that number must increase during development to avoid birth defects. So we can study the prevention of birth defects using this kind of technology. In this example, I 3D printed a, a circuit using human brain cells, neurons, right, in a network. And the glowing signals that we are imaging, communicating with each other among the neurons is the basis, really, of everything that makes human intelligence and personality. So for me, optics is the science of light, and it's been a great and profound journey, really, through engineering. But for you, right, how will you grow? How will you flex the muscles of the mind? You may be wondering, how do I stand out from a crowd? Or, or how will I stay relevant in a world where AI is you know, encroaching on human jobs. What will I study to make, to make myself value? Well, rest assured, computers still can't do two key things. And those two things are compassion and creativity, right? Just because something hasn't existed doesn't mean that you can't create it, right? So I want you to learn to build your brain for original thought. And, uh, and, and you, can, you, you can see it, you can believe it, and then ultimately you can do it. See, when you're in the business of breakthroughs, you have to see it before you can believe it. And that's before you can do it for the first time, right? So process of scientific discovery, you know, it's, it's sort of a lot like hiking. So, you know, in hiking, you drive your car out to the mountain and you, you park at the parking lot and you see all your neighbors, they've all driven their cars out and you all start hiking and you start going up the mountain and there you are, you're climbing, you've got your water and you're, you know, your uh, granola bar. 
And you're looking at your neighbor, and they're hiking to it. As you get halfway out the mountain, the, the crowd starts to thin out, thin out. And by the time you get to the top of the mountain, you are all alone. You're all alone. And it's, it can be lonely and cold when you've made a breakthrough. But the view is amazing. And the, the attraction of science is that then you get to bring that back down the mountain for, for all, for all. And that process is called the peer review process. So you can take your private reality and bring it to everybody for the benefit of, of humanity. So with optics, the science of light, I've been able to create some imaging systems, some e engineer some imaging systems that nobody has ever seen before. Therefore, the things they see, nobody has ever seen before. So that's what drives me, is I can tell that I'm seeing something brand new when I've made, effectively, the eyeball that is seeing it, right? Um, and that's what really drives me. But I am just a small part in something much bigger that I've talked to you about today. Whether it is Einstein or, or Leeuwenhoek, all these great minds had one thing in common. They all loved chocolate. No, no. They, they, they all had a vision, right? To, see, to do something that has never happened before, something that's new and creative. Can you find another pattern in this group of faces? Anybody? Good. That's good. So they're almost all men. And the question is, well, where are the women? The lack of the women in history of science either means that there has been a great inequity to be addressed, or it means that they have, that history has effectively lied to us and erased their accomplishments. Either way, it's bad news. And we need to ask, where are the women? Where are the women? <laughs> right? But there's hope. Just because things have been a certain way doesn't mean that's the way they need to be in the future. Okay? The great thing about the, the, the minds you have is that no one can stop your dreams. Nobody can stop you from climbing that mountain and seeing things for the first time. So my advice to you is see it, believe it, do it. Thank you very much. So now I've been told to take some questions and answers. I have this thing, this microphone that I can throw, which gives me great pleasure as an engineer.